Jihad is gentle. Jihad is kind. Jihad is all just in your mind. That's what they tell us anyway, but then the bombs go off. And us, they slay. That's why we're here. That's why we speak. To warn of Jihad from here to Mozambique. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to This Week in Jihad with the great David Wood. I am Robert Spencer, author of the Holy Quran, and David is, of course, the world's foremost Christian apologist and critic of the religion of peace. Welcome, David. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. From here to Mozambique, we are glad to see you. Yeah, Robert's going to, uh, you're going to need to put that together into a book. <laughs> An how epic many, how, poem. How many? Do you have no. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to count 10 or 12, I guess. So you've got a bunch of books out there. and um, But but it would be cool, right, if like people look you up on Wikipedia, look up your description, and it says, you know, he's Islamophobe, he's this, this, he's this, he's this, he's this, and a poet. Yes. That'd be pretty cool. Well, I know it. I hope I don't blow it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to have to think about that. You know, poetry, it's a serious thing. It's a very serious matter. Um, in any case, David, there's a lot of jihad. Shall we start with the ever popular stupid infidels of the week? Gotta have, I gotta have, gotta have my stupid infidels. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are, of course, as always, every week, a plethora of stupid infidels. A veritable cornucopia of stupid infidels. And I think we might be best advised to start... Well, I see, you know something, you are unidentified today. Why is that? That's funny. It's never What's happened that? before. Uh, your name is not on the screen. I don't know why that is. I mean, I, everybody knows you are David Wood, but it's just not there. And since we are well, on... It, yes. was a, it was a it was a totally different setup and so on so okay uh, uh, these things I'm happen I, in fact I'm, i mean if, if people can even hear me right now i'm impressed because this was all sort of uh uh I, I i had sort of patched everything together for a debate the other day and then um anyway had yeah we can hear you things, but we uh, can yeah, see you anticipating. we just don't know who you are because your name's not That's there good. underneath so some guy is here with us today, and we're going to discuss the stupid infidel capital of the world, which is, of course, Rotherham, or Rotherham, in uh, the UK, where 1,400... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes. Oh, yeah, I was going to, I was going to, I was just, when you said Rotherham, I was going to ask if that was the place where year after year after year, these gangs were going around grooming, drugging, raping, gang raping, <clears throat> pimping young british girls and the authorities knew about it social workers police prosecutors they all knew about it but they were all so terrified of being called racists or islamophobes that they just let it happen in other words if you're in a situation this is the method this is the message of the authorities in rotherham if you are completely aware of guys gang raping 12 13 14 year old girls but if you say something about it, you'll be called names. You look the other way and just ignore it for years until it. it becomes until you're exposed and it becomes so embarrassing that you're basically forced to do something about it. Then maybe you do something about it. Is, it, is, is that the I'm saying is that the city you're talking about? Robert? That's it, man. Uh, Rotherham is where they say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will really hurt me. And so they were so afraid, as you noted, of being called Islamophobic. At least 1,400 girls were victimized, their lives destroyed. By the way, we do know who you are now. I, was, I, I figured out what was missing there, and now it says, ladies and gentlemen, David Wood. Anyway, no, uh, one, no, one, no one troubleshoots tech problems like Robert Spencer. It's amazing. Too. It's amazing. It's, it's really... Uh... Anyway. So, 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 so Islamophobe, poet... <laughs> I want that on my tombstone. Remember that. Anyway, uh, what we have here in Rotherham is further confirmation of what you just said. 
because there are ongoing investigations. And now, as it turns out, there were counselors, that is local, like city councilmen, we would call them in America, I believe, and they knew and remained silent about the Muslim rape gangs for precisely the reasons that you outlined. So it wasn't just the police. It was also the city authorities. And so we have here in the chat a very apropos quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is when good men do nothing. You could put that on the tombstone of Rotherham in the UK. And so they are the stupid infidel capital of the world, the undisputed champion. Of course, they do have quite a lot of competition. So perhaps I shouldn't say that they're totally undisputed. Kind of ironic story came out of Ireland right next door this past week, David. There was a demonstration in uh, Dublin in favor of open borders. The Irish authorities are under fire for letting in so many migrants. There are some Irish who think this is unwise that at very least these people should be vetted, something. And so there was a demonstration on the other side of people who think open borders are great. Everybody should come in. This is not really a country. This is just sort of a parking lot for whoever wants to pass through. And they held a demo. And I thought that the demo, David, turned into kind of a parable of the logical outcome of these kinds of policies. Because right behind the demonstrators protesting in favor of open borders and chanting their open borders slogans and singing their open borders songs came a group of Muslims marching and screaming. What were they yelling, David? Uh, I have to go with Allahu Akbar. Yes. Once again, you got it right on the money. And they were holding signs, protesting. What do you think they were protesting, David? Um, hmm. <laughs> there, there, there are several things. I, I'd probably go with Israel. Israel is a very good guess, but this is the very first time, I think, on, this, on the history of this program. That's right. <laughs> they were protesting against Quran burning. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that actually made more sense in light, of, uh, in light of recent events. Yes. And so I thought this is a very direct insight into the consequences of unvetted mass migration not a hippy dippy diverse multicultural society where everybody loves one another and rides unicorns together but the supremacy of islam and sharia demonstrations against the freedom of speech and freedom of expression cries of allahu akbar which is a declaration of supremacy over all other religions and the people who hold to them it was a it was a vivid illustration of what is to come, what Ireland has in store in its future, although so few there are aware of it. Hey, you, you know what you might need to do? You might need to uh, eventually have a, uh, could have an Olympics, a stupid infidels Olympics. Um, yeah, a sort of a even, special, very yeah, special or, Olympics. Or you could even do a weekly thing where if you go through like four or five um, stupid infidel stories. You can have people vote on who is the dumbest. Oh, that's good. That's good. It would be hotly contested. Yeah, I believe you could do. I believe you could do. I believe you could do. In the chats, you could actually poll people on who the dumbest infidel of the week is. And uh... suddenly, you got an echo. Everything was fine, and then you began to echo. Tech problems. That was fine. We'll just okay. let's just Sometimes... plow on. Yeah, sometimes temporary, so. Yes. Okay, so in the UK, since we're uh, in the UK and its environs, yes, ladies and gentlemen, Ireland is not the UK, but it's near it. And that's something that many Irish find objectionable, but they think they had troubles before. Just you wait. Anyway, um, in the UK itself is part of the ongoing... Uh, investigations into the PREVENT program, their counter-terror program. Uh, it came to light that Musharraf Hussein, the uh, 
leader of a group in Nottingham. Nottingham is isn't that where Robin Hood was from? And now Mushadaf Hussein is the uh, robbing from the rich and giving to the poor there because he received two hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. That's two hundred thousand pounds from Prevent. But meanwhile, he has referred to Hamas as a legitimate resistance group. And so this terrorist organization that glories in the killing of civilians, he says is a legitimate group. And meanwhile, on the other side, he's raking in 200,000 pounds from the people who are supposed to be fighting terrorism in the UK. Mushadaf Hussein, a smart jihadi, not a dumb yeah, infidel. It's, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, at this point, you have to say people deserve what they get. I'm, you know, I'm not saying... You know, terrorist attacks you you deserve it and so on but i mean if you're i mean if you're literally handing money to people who are promoting and defending hamas it's like what what are you expecting mm -hmm. indeed so there's more out of the uk it's stupid uk week here i think uh but we'll see how things develop it's still early the uh this, this study, you know, of prevent, we spoke about this last week, that the uh, there was an independent study of the prevent counterterror program, and it found that they were not speaking honestly about jihad, that they, they had no recognition of Islamist terrorism in this program, because, of course, it would be Islamophobic. The uh, program was found to be not doing enough to fight Islamist extremism, as it called it. So what do you think has been the response? Amnesty International has actually denounced the report about Prevent. What do you think they think is wrong with it, David? Um, hmm, I don't know here. Yeah, it's, a, it's not really as tough as it might seem. Amnesty International is upset about this report because the report says that the PREVENT program is not doing enough to fight Islamist extremism. So Amnesty International says this report is Islamophobic. Islamophobic, yeah, yes, not doing course. enough. That's right. And so Ilyas Nagdi, who is the racial justice director for Amnesty International UK, says this review is riddled with biased thinking errors and plain anti-muslim prejudice frankly the review has no legitimacy and i wonder if anybody is considering at all anywhere in the uk in any tiny hovel somewhere whether maybe just possibly ilyas nagdi is a bit prejudiced in this regard and is not exactly an unbiased observer. Uh, no, of course not, because that would be Islamophobic, and that's the root of the problem. It, it, it's, it seems like any organization, it really seems like in order to please, uh, you know, groups like Amnesty International and any other groups, it seems like the only thing that any group can be concerned with is Islamophobia. That's the only thing you're allowed to be bothered by. Uh, you can't be at all bothered by jihad or the people who are promoting it or the people who are promoting it online or the people who are saying uh do it now or the people who are saying get you know you should be preparing behind the scenes and learning you know uh learning how to fight behind the scenes um you can't be concerned about that at all you can only be you can only be worried about islamophobia and going after them otherwise you are part of the problem indeed interesting sidelight on that david it came to light that a Polish politician, as, as a matter of fact, the former foreign minister of Poland, Radoslaw Sikorski, has been paid regularly over the last few years by the United Arab Emirates. And he's received $500,000 from the United Arab Emirates, 100000 a year for the last five years, just for being such a sweet guy. 
And, you know, I, I saw that. I, got, I, I started to wonder if maybe some of the stupid infidels are not all that stupid. They're paid infidels. They are infidels who are profiting from be, be taking on the guise of stupid infidels. Yeah. And so it, 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 it's, it seems like, here's what it seems like. It seems like most of them, most of the dumb infidels, you can get what you want out of them just by manipulating them. And so you you praise them when all they all they're worried about is Islamophobia. And if they're at all concerned about, you know, raping girls or anything like that, then you shower them with uh, charges of racism and bigotry and Islamophobia. And you can control massive numbers of you. Can, I mean, you, it seems like you can almost control entire civilizations just with that, just this uh, uh, this praising and abusing and you can control lots of people like that but maybe there are people who don't fall for that so easily they're 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 aware of how manipulation tactics are being used and so for them you actually got to cough up some money you actually got to start sending them some serious cash to get that but either way that people ultimately do what you want it raises some interesting historical questions you know um like in vienna in 1683 and another Pole, Jan Sobieski, faced down the Ottomans and defeated them on September 12, 1683. And that was the high water mark of Ottoman expansion into Eastern Europe. Now, the question is, what if the Ottomans had called Jan Sobieski Islamophobic? Well, he'd have, he'd have invited them in. <laughs> yep. Looks like I'm it. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't want you to call me a name. So by all means, come on in. And if Jan Sobieski turned out to be made of stronger stuff, maybe the Ottomans could have offered him some cash. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, if you're offering me some money to subjugate my entire people, um, well, as long as I'm OK, that's all that matters. Isn't that sick stuff for the people who are doing this, right? Like mm -hmm. they're selling future generations off for cash. That's right. And speaking of which, we have the European Union. And you'll be happy to know, David, that they have just appointed a new coordinator for combating Islamophobia. Yay! <laughs> just Finally. like uh, in Canada. Finally. Canada just got their Islamophobia czar, or czarina, Amina El Gawabi. And now the EU Commission has Marion... Lalice. She is the new coordinator for combating Islamophobia, a French-born European Union official with previous diplomatic experience in Yemen, Mauritania, and Morocco. And her most recent post was distributing aid to Turkish Cypriots, that is, to the part of, Turkey, of Cyprus that is occupied illegally by Turkey since 1974. And so the uh, appointment of Marion Lalice has been hailed by a George Soros-funded NGO as holistic, comprehensive, goal-oriented, and intersectional approach in countering Islamophobia. And you know what all that verbiage means. There will be no more honest talk about jihad violence. Islamophobia is a trick. It's a sleight of hand because it's used to refer to attacks on innocent Muslims that nobody supports. And also to honest discussion of the motivating ideology behind jihad violence. And by saying that they are fighting against the one, the vigilante attacks against innocent Muslims, they use it to silence the honest discussion like what we are having right now about jihad violence classic bait and switch and it's weird i mean you if we didn't know from experience how well this works and you were to tell me hey here's what's going to happen um jihadis are going to be blowing up buildings and blowing up trains and blowing up buses and slaughtering people and they're going to have their playbook you're, you're going to have open access to their playbook. It's going to—it's all going to be written right there, and you're going to have 14 centuries of history to look at and see exactly what the plan is. 
and you've got you've got uh, uh, their own words today because we've we've got them we've got them recorded They're, they they say it in YouTube videos they say what their plans are in YouTube videos but we're going to appeal to the goodwill of Westerners and we're going to say hey you don't approve of randomly slaughtering or persecuting or attacking people who, who aren't doing any of that, do you? And you go, no. And like, okay, well, that's, is, it's, that's Islamophobia when people go around and just <clears throat> randomly slaughter Muslims in the streets. You're against that, right? Yeah, of course. So would you be okay if we combat Islamophobia? Sure, yeah, of course you need to combat Islamophobia. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, our real definition of Islamophobia is anyone who says anything critical of Islam or jihad or anything else that's connected at all. Anyone who ever questions anything we do while we're slaughtering and raping and all that other stuff is an Islamophobe. But thank you for thank you for giving us the power to silence all the people who are actually concerned. That's where we are. That's what's happening. And so the EU has one. Canada has one. That is Islamophobia czars, Islamophobia chiefs, and more countries are certain to follow. All right, now we have uh, France. In France, there was a young man from Bangladesh staying at a youth hostel in Bruay la Buissière, or someplace. And he attacked the caretaker there with a knife while saying what do you think david what might he have been saying it's a wild guess but somehow you've gotten it wow. anyway he has been uh sentenced for attacking the caretaker with a knife which is essentially attempted murder he did not answer or cooperate with the proceedings at the trial at all. He was on trial for intending to kill, and he got 30 months in prison. So he'll probably be there for about a year, and then he'll be out on the streets again, able to wage more jihad. Just like so many ISIS jihadis who... Are about to be released who are being released back onto the streets indeed and then we go over to germany always a good place for stupid infidels and this story goes back to june 2022 yeah yeah uh -oh. yeah ja, ja, you went silent there for a minute did i you didn't hear my yeah. du hast recht i did hear that that was all Oh, okay. Oh, we're good then. Okay. It's a little buggy, I think, but we'll make it through. Anyway. Yeah, I just want to find out. Just want to find out if that's on my end or your end, because that would affect the problem solving. Everything looks the same here, but what do I know? Uh, anyway. In Germany, we have uh, in Köln, Hassan H. Actually, this was in Bonn. This guy's on trial in Cologne, but it took place in Bonn. Why he's not on trial in Bonn, I don't know. But anyway, uh, he is famous now because he cut off the head of his friend and he threw it in front of the district court in Bonn. For that, he got a year and a half in prison. <laughs> and <laughs> now he's back in court. And he was back in court because he went to an office where he introduced himself to one of the employees as the man who cut off a man's head in Bonn. And then he threatened the employees in this office that he would cut off their heads also. And so he is back in court and he explains, I was angry. 
I told them about the crime, but he denies actually threatening anyone. He was just trying to get a job, David. Can't you give a man an honest break? But, I mean, notice the, uh, hey guys, trying to get a job, and uh, I'll chop all your heads off like I did that other guy. <laughs> You'd think you'd think that's a pretty insane way to go about it, but I mean, if you've been conditioned by years of seeing, all you have to do is threaten people to get your way, and they'll immediately back down and give you anything you want. Why wouldn't you try that, right? Why wouldn't you? You've been Indeed. you've been program you've been programmed to get your way by doing that. Yeah, that's a very good point. That uh, he might not even have known how crazy he was being. Uh, he might have figured, well, this is how I've always gotten what I wanted in Germany. So maybe if I tell them that I beheaded uh, this guy and I'll threaten to behead them, they'll make me the Bundeskanzler. Lisa, Lisa Leto said, that's some resume. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I'd like to see it written out. Um, it, it's the job chop offers this, are going to pour in. Chop this dude's head off. You will be next if you don't give me job. You're hired, my friend. Okay, so uh, we actually have some real jihad, some uh, violent jihad this week. Quite a lot, unfortunately. Uh, we have Cameroon. In Cameroon... There were fishermen who were going about their business and fishing in communities around Lake Chad in North Cameroon when Boko Haram, the jihad group that originated in Nigeria, came along and murdered eight fishermen. Now, David, they were just fishing. Why on earth would Boko Haram, a group that wants to establish a caliphate, in West Africa, want to kill ordinary guys who are just out fishing. Um, I mean, there, there are, there, are, I mean, my goodness, there are multiple <clears throat> possible defenses depending on on who the guys are. But uh, you know, anyone who is going to support potentially the military or the police that would stand in your way can be a target as well because they're they're funding those who oppose you also they might want to just strike terror in the population that's true as well mm -hmm. uh they're ultimately trying of course to destabilize the local government and law enforcement apparatus so that it falls and they can then replace it with an islamic state over in Syria, kind of a similar thing happened. About 75 people were out in the country in the Palmyra area, uh, in the eastern countryside of Homs. And they were collecting truffles, which is a type of mushroom, I believe. And they were set upon by ISIS, the Islamic State which uh, summarily murdered 11 of them. Now here again, so we have fishermen in Cameroon, truffle hunters, mushroom collectors in Syria. And it's the same thing in both cases. Uh, strike terror in the enemies of Allah, maybe strike against people they think are supporters of whatever regime they're trying to topple. The... Uh... There, there might have been an added dimension for the truffle hunters because uh, truffle hunters often use pigs. Oh, pigs, pigs can pigs can smell the truffles, so they actually have trained pigs that go around and can sniff around and find the truffles, and then you dig them up. David, you're a marvel. How how does anybody know how you hunt truffles? And now you're going to tell me why well, was a truffle hunter in the? Yeah. No, no, I saw I, I saw it on a show about <laughs> hunting truffles. <laughs> No, you, you, you're, you know, you're like 30 years old and you have this packed resume. Talk, speaking of resumes, you know, and done this and done that and done everything else. And it's very impressive. So you never know. You might have spent a few years hunting for mushrooms out there with pigs. 
Yeah, it's on my resume and uh, chopping heads off. Uh... <laughs> it's a winning combination. Democratic Republic of the Congo, formerly Zaire in Central Africa. 22 people in uh, two separate attacks in villages in Congo killed by the Allied Democratic Forces, which is a jihad group, contrary to its name. The Allied Democratic Forces styles itself as ISIS, is the Islamic State, in that area. Killed 22 people in separate attacks there. Uh, that is once again in service of trying to establish a caliphate. Now we come to some honest teachers of Islam. Now this is very rare. In the West, we have so many guys who are teachers of Islam who lie about it incessantly and constantly are gaslighting us and telling us that it does not teach what it plainly does teach if we open up the Quran and read the Hadiths and the Sirah of the Prophet. So it's refreshing, really, when we come upon somebody like Lot Fola Dejkam, who is the representative of the Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, in the Fars province of Iran. And Lot Fola Dejkam said in a Friday sermon last week, Jews, particularly Jews and Zionists, I don't know what he meant by that, Jews, particularly Jews, but that's what it, the transcript says, are presented in the Quran as your enemies. You see, recently they attacked our military site with one of their drones. They are your enemies. If you sit by and say that you want to befriend them, they will not become your friends. They want to destroy you. We have to get to know these enemies. Surely he can't be right, David, can he? The Quran doesn't say that the Jews are the enemies of the Muslims. The Quran says that the Jews love the Muslims and vice versa, right? Uh, that would be incorrect, Robert. And it's actually uh, interesting that he um, was more honest about what the Quran teaches because it's very common for um, it's very common for Muslims to say, oh, it's not Jews in general we have a problem with, it's just Zionist Jews. But that that wasn't that wasn't Jews that were in Muhammad's time that he had a problem with. He just he ended up just having a problem with Jews. At first, it was okay because he, the Jews would accept him as a prophet. Once they rejected him, then he's just got this generalized population. Um, uh, I mean, he's he's got this problem with this general population of Jews, and that was the case even with, even before even before the reestablishment of, of Israel. So uh, this the correct jews and you can say and particular you know more well let, let me put it this way there's a general problem with jews but an even bigger problem for zionists because they're under an additional death sentence but that's that's similar to the boat that everyone's in right there's a general problem with unbelievers in general but if you've done something to especially bother them then you may be under multiple additional death sentences but yeah, yeah. at least at least at least is being honest yes he is he actually referred to two quran verses because when he says if you sit by and say that you want to befriend them they will not become your friends that is resonant of 551, 551. chapter 5 verse 51 of the quran do not take jews and christians as your friends and then when he says that the Jews are presented in the Quran as your enemies, that is very clearly 582, chapter 5, verse 82, which says that uh, the enmity runs most hot, hottest among those who are Jews, the enmity toward the Muslims, that is. All right, meanwhile, we have, let's see, I think we have some other honest jihadis oh yeah this is out of france this was a guy who uh 41 years old and he is identified in the news story french language news story as a muslim 
and he is extremely entrenched in his religion. That is what the um, story says. And the uh, upshot is that he wanted to take his daughters to morning prayers at the mosque at 5 a.m. The daughter, the, the partner, not the daughters, the partner refused. And so they started to argue. He punched her and she was unable to work for three days. So he must have punched her pretty hard. After that, she filed a complaint. She wanted to leave him and he was even angrier. He said, a good Muslim does not divorce. This couple is from Morocco and they were living in France. He uh, started to force the family to learn Arabic and to memorize the first 12 chapters of the Quran. Now, I think it's interesting that they're from Morocco, and yet he's forcing them to learn Arabic. So they may be Berbers or something else that their first language is not Arabic. But in any case, he's wanting them to learn Arabic, memorize the first 12 chapters of the Quran, uh, Maybe their first language is French. He says, if you continue to speak French, I will disfigure you, he said to his wife. And then he, his daughter is standing there, David, while he says, if you, if you continue to speak French, I will disfigure you. And so he sees that his daughter is alarmed, and he says to her to reassure her, it does not matter. Dad has the right to hit mom. To educate her. Now, surely that's on Islamic, isn't it, David? I don't know what Quran you've been reading, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually—I mean—it's actually a really bad situation because I mean, if if all we had to go, if all we had to go on was the Quran, and it says. Um, you know, from those on whose part you fear rebellion or desertion or disobedience or however they want to translate that, then there's this escalation. You you warn them, you banish them to beds apart, and then you beat them. Um, that would be enough to sound really, really bad. Because if you want to say, you know, they want to say, ah, what that means is tap them with a toothbrush. That doesn't sound like it makes sense, right? It's, wait a minute, I've warned you already. And now I'm escalating because that's not working. So I'm banishing you to a separate bed. And then if that's not working, then I'm taking the final, the final strategy. <laughs> tap you with a toothbrush. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it doesn't make sense in the escalation of it that's in the passage. Uh, so anyway, that would be bad enough. And it would rule out enough reinterpretations if we just had the Quran to go on. But then when you factor in the hadith and you see how this is played out and that you can actually beat a woman until her skin turns green this guy is indeed entrenched in his religion he knows what his religion teaches mm -hmm. but his defense lawyer says that the prosecution is just trying to demonize the defendant he's the real victim here David and yeah. the uh, pros the defense attorney says I have the impression that a Muslim terrorist is on trial. This guy's not a terrorist. He just threatened to disfigure his wife. It was all in the day, just a little family tiff. What's the big deal? Uh, he and the prosecutor doesn't seem to have any idea what's really going on either because the prosecutor, um, whose name, by the way, is Khadija Ben Bani, says that he's hiding his tyranny and machismo in the cloak of religion. So it isn't as if there's any tyranny and machismo in Islam, you see. It's that he's just uh, using it as a pretext, and really Islam is wonderfully feminist. Isn't that right, David? Yeah, and I would, uh, I mean, gosh, if I were these, uh, you know, <clears throat> if I were like defense lawyers and stuff, I'd just go all in every time on accusing everyone of Islamophobia. And I would, I would bring it up to the judge. I would bring it up to the jury. I would just be like, guys, 
it says right here it says right here this man can beat his wife it says it it says it as clear as day he can beat her if he even thinks she's she might get out of line so if you say he can't do that or he's in trouble for doing what this book says then you are against this book and you're calling muhammad a prophet that shouldn't be listened to and you're condemning 1.6 billion people who believe in this book is that what you're doing because that's what you're doing if you find my def if you find the defendant guilty mm -hmm. that's it and what and watch how quickly they back down no we can't judge other cultures like that we can't say that muhammad's a false prophet so case dismissed ladies and gentlemen no further questions that kind of thing's coming. As a matter of fact, you know, that's already here, really. It reminds me of uh, the female genital mutilation trials that were going on in Michigan. And the judge threw them out, said, this is freedom of religion issue. And that was that. So the poor victims have no recourse. Wow. Yep. All right, same thing in Bangladesh. A uh, Hindu young man, Paritosh Sarkar, was accused of making blasphemous comments on Facebook. And he was sentenced this past week to five years in prison and fined 30,000 taka. I don't know how much 30,000 taka is. Maybe somebody can tell us in the comments. But in the meantime, uh, he actually has a total because he has separate sentences of 11 years in prison, but they're going to run concurrently. So it's going to be five years in prison for blasphemy, for hurting religious sentiments. Of course, since there's accusations of blasphemy, he could be killed by lynching at any time. <clears throat> but meanwhile, because of this case, because of allegations about his insulting Islam on Facebook, uh there was a Hindu village, a fishing village, actually, in Bangladesh. The, the entire village was burned down. Sixty houses were torched. And the Muslim mob vandalized the village, looting the houses, taking away valuables and livestock, vandalizing the Hindu temples, breaking the idols, etc., etc., etc. Nobody has been imprisoned. Nobody has been charged. Only the alleged blasphemer, who is Hindu. It does seem like a two-tier justice system somehow, David, but that couldn't be, could it? Yeah, but by the way, it, I mean, that is a... It's evil, but that's a brilliant strategy of, hey, if one guy does something, then we'll just, we'll just go after tons of uh, <clears throat> random people and so on. So if one guy does something, we'll just target, you know, Hindus or whatever. It reminds me, I saw this when I was, uh, I was still a teenager, but, but there was a movie called Under Siege. Tommy Lee Jones takes over, I forget what it was, a battleship or something like a U.S. battleship. He's a terrorist. And uh, he gets on there. And then one of the American soldiers says, tries to stop them. And Tommy Lee Jones shoots him and then shoots the guy beside him. And then he goes, warning to everyone else. If you decide to be a hero, I will not only shoot you, I will shoot the person standing beside you. In other words, for, for people who are willing to put their lives on the line, might not be able to will not might not be willing to put other people's lives on the on the line. Mm. And uh, Islam seems to have a good feeling for that. If you want to risk blasphemy, okay. But if you want to risk your life for, <clears throat> to blaspheme others, that's fine. But just so you know, uh, we might burn entire villages down over this. So so watch what you do. Meanwhile, you know it's funny how there's so much blasphemy in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh. And I do wonder if it ha if there's room for introspection. Do any Muslims in Pakistan or Bangladesh ever stop to wonder why any minority group, any person from any minority group in either of those countries would ever want to blaspheme Islam? What is it that in their day-to-day -day lives they encounter that makes them think negatively about Islam. Why on earth would the religion of peace and tolerance that is so benign and cuddly, according to every last politician in the Western world, why would they think that it's not just paradise to live in an Islamic society? 
Yeah, imagine you're a uh, you're a Christian family. You've got your ten uh, year old daughter, and the uh, you know, local jihadis come over, take your daughter. Um, they you try her back, you go to the judge. The judge says, "Oh, we have this signed document saying she willingly converted to Islam." Said, what? My daughter can't write. Said, oh yeah, they wrote it for her. They wrote it for her, and uh, basically you find out. These guys can just come take your daughters and any time they can they can rape them they can uh, forcibly convert them marry them off and so on and uh, at some point you start to get an idea that you don't like this ideology because of what it what it calls for in terms of your treatment but then you say something against it and oh you criticized it now we either now we have to either uh, uh, you know gather around and and treat you like a pinata in the streets or you know you get locked up for the rest of your life for criticizing it but man that's like and what what's what's amazing is as you've talked about previously there are muslims calling for this in the west right like like, mm -hmm. like they want a global council to judge these um judge these cases of islamophobia and you look how it's handled in the places that have it and they want to oppose it everywhere and then you look at places like canada and all these all these uh all these other places europe and ah we gotta we gotta we gotta get these you know special envoys on islamophobia and everything it's like how are you not seeing what actually happens when these guys have this kind of power to punish people for blasphemy how do you not how do you not get it because you're putting putting a lot of lives in danger very much so. Excellent point. And that's uh, a, a case in point comes to us once again from the UK. Four Afghan boys, ages 13 to 16, who arrived in the UK last year on boats across the English Channel. They have been charged in connection with the rape of a 15-year-old girl at the school that they attended in Dover. Now, what on earth, why would we talk about a story like that, David? There's rape all over the place, rape everywhere. Why would this one be something that would have to do with this week in jihad? Well, uh, almost everyone, almost all groups condemn rape. And so when someone, some individual rapes someone, everyone can condemn what that person has done but no one no one agrees with what that person has done uh but in cases like this where you have this entire ideology which derives right from the quran that you can treat people outside of your religion like this you can capture them you can rape them and so on but basically you can treat them like garbage because as uh, in 90 verse 6 says they are the worst of creatures no one cares what you do to a worm or a slug so why not? So in this case, it's, uh, it's actually connected to the ideology. Indeed. And yet nobody in the UK is willing to look at that or to confront the ideology. And speaking of what these Western countries have brought upon themselves, there's news in the case of Seifullo Saipov this week. You remember Seifullo Saipov, David? He's the fellow who drove a truck along a bike path in New York City on Halloween night in 2017 and killed eight people. And he is uh, quite spectacularly unrepentant. He said he was inspired by ISIS and he still believes in the Islamic State and that it was the will of Allah that he carry out his attack. But he's facing the death penalty and his lawyers are trying to prevent him from getting the death penalty. Now, I don't understand. Maybe his lawyers don't like him, so they don't want him to get the virgins. But he is trying not to get the death penalty. And they're saying that it's the fault of former U.S. President Donald Trump in speaking about the case at the time that the attack happened. And that he was a recipient of a diversity visa and so the defense is now using invoking that to say well we all know trump is bad therefore this guy should not get the death penalty because he trump was using him to criticize the diversity visa and chain migration programs 
And so that's all very well. But the question is, if this succeeds and these programs continue, how many more jihadis are we going to get? Is anybody paying attention? It would be Islamophobic to pay too much attention, would it not? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 always this. It's always the same. It's always some version of the exact same method. Whether it's the grooming gangs and convincing people not to complain about that or care here in the U.S. No matter how many terrorist attacks there are, you're a bigot if you bring it up in any way. And so. Yeah, I mean, that that's the direction I'd go if I were if I were lawyers. I mean, you've got a guy who's ramming a truck into people. If if, if any, I mean, in the in the name of in the name of his guy, so it's terror. That is a guys. Keep in mind, there's a difference between mass murder and terror. You could just ah, I'm angry one day and go kill a bunch of people. That's mass murder. If you do it to spread a message about your ideology, that's that's the terrorism category. And for you know. Uh, successful terrorists, people who actually kill people for their ideology, um, usually a, usually governments lean in favor of, of the death penalty as a deterrent to, to future ones. But man, if you could just say, ah, but Islamophobia or but Donald Trump or something like that, yeah, to probably be seeing more of that if this works at all. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, very similar story out, not similar to Saipov, but the one before it. Uh, in France, a 49-year-old Algerian migrant with 11 prior convictions. And so this all is of a piece, David, that, you know, we bring in these people, we have no idea who they are, no concern about whether they're jihadis or not, or what their attitudes are toward infidel women and so on. And then they commit crime after crime and everybody's too afraid of charges of Islamophobia to do anything about it. So this guy, 49 years old, 11 prior convictions, he comes up to a 13-year-old French schoolgirl walking along the street in Senon, C-E-N-O-N, -N, I don't know, southwestern France, and he starts to try to rape her in the middle of the street. But he is stopped by another teenager who tackled him and stopped him from raping the girl in the middle of the street. This is uh, yet another example of what we see so often about uh, so many of these guys' attitudes toward women who are not Muslim. How do they get this idea, David, that this is something that is acceptable behavior? Notice, notice the double idea, right? This guy has a double idea. He has two ideas, um, one from his religion and two from how we respond to his religion in the West. He had the idea that it is perfectly acceptable for him to go up and grab a girl and rape her. And two, he had the idea that no one's going to do anything about it you're, because you are so cowardly. You are so cowardly. You're just going to let it happen. And I've seen, I've seen Muslims bragging about that. We can do anything we want. They are too cowardly to stand up to anything we're going to do. And so, I mean, when you said someone intervened and actually stopped him, I'm actually like to the point where, I mean, think that it seems obvious that someone would do that, right? If you're just thinking, I mean, especially back in the day where some, no one, people aren't going to allow that to happen. But given the way things have gone in recent years, I was actually impressed that someone jumped in and, and stopped mm -hmm. the man from raping a girl. It's actually, wow, someone, someone stepped in there and did yeah. something? I'm shocked that the person wasn't too worried about, oh, what if I jump in and protect this girl from being raped? I'll be called an Islamophobe. That's exactly what we saw from British police. Mm -hmm. The same kind of impunity we see in France also in another yet another story. This uh, guy who is yet another Muslim migrant. Actually, I'm not sure he's a migrant, but he is certainly a Muslim. Uh, went to a church. Now, there are not many people who go to church in France. So uh, lately I've been seeing so many stories like this. I wonder if there are more jihadis in churches than there are actually Christians praying. Um, hey, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't let me forget because that might be a funny skit. We'll get a, we'll get a, uh, we'll get a church in France. 
and the jihadis decide to attack it and they run in there Allah, Allah! hey wait a minute it's just us jihadis in here <laughs> yes so this guy he goes into a church in paris and he threatens to kill the priest uh he had a machete no sorry that's another an older story out of spain that we've already discussed uh this guy just threatens to kill the priest um, nothing happened. Nobody, nobody stopped him. Nobody tackled him, but he didn't do anything. So he went out and went to another church and threatened to kill the priest there. Uh, I think that's a good indication of the impunity you're talking about, that some of these guys think they can do anything that they want and nothing will happen. And we constantly confirm them as absolutely correct. Yes, indeed. And also absolutely correct is uh, an Islamic scholar out of Egypt, Dr. Atiya Adlan. Now, Atiya Adlan is unusually honest. We were talking earlier about honest Islamic clerics and scholars. And this is what Atiya Adlan said. We must make an effort and adhere to the explicit Quranic verses in order to strengthen the basic principles, okay? And so he goes on, O Muslims, the book of Allah is before us, and it calls explicitly, loudly, and resoundingly to wage jihad for the sake of Allah in order to make Allah's word supreme. What does it mean to wage jihad for the sake of Allah? That means like getting the kids to school on time, right? Yeah, that and going to the gym. Yeah. Actually, waging jihad for the sake of Allah, that is a very specific concept in Islamic theology that relates to hot warfare against infidels for the sake of establishing the hegemony of Islam. All right, uh, very quickly, we had a big vehicular jihad attack in Jerusalem in which a six-year-old boy and an eight-year-old boy were killed. And then, of course, the handing out of sweets afterward we have the erosion of the islamic republic of iran there's been a very much, a great slowdown in news out of the islamic republic uh, as they've cracked down on the uh, stories getting out but the second in command of the islamic revolutionary guards corps which is often called the Iranian Revolutionary Guards or just Revolutionary Guards in the Western press. But the official name is the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. But because they're a terror group, the Western press tries to cover for them. They say that they are, their group, a lot of people in the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards are experiencing doubt and confusion. So that's a very positive sign. Yeah. Uh, did, did you see? Did you see they uh, they exiled their their best uh, female chess player? No, I missed the chess player. Didn't yeah, wear so, a hijab. Yeah. So a while back, she was at a tournament and refused to wear the uh, hijab um, as a show as a sign of solidarity with the women who are protesting. And uh, Iran exiled her. I said, if you come back to this country, we're going to arrest you. So now she's not allowed back into the country. And she's living in Spain. And I was like, wait, you think that's punishment? <laughs> like you, can't, you can't come back. You can't come back to Iran. Yeah, um, you have but, to live but, but in I mean, Spain. But I mean, think about this. It, it, she's, a, she's a woman. Uh, her category is, is woman grandmaster. So she's, she's an international master and a woman. So one of their smartest young, smartest young women in the, in the country. And courageous right i mean when someone's saying hey i know what i can face by uh protesting against this regime and i'm going to do it anyway she understands she is putting her life on the line so notice who notice who iran does not want in their country smart courageous women you guys got to stay in stay in europe or something interesting sounds like a nazi germany you know and all the uh brilliant people who were jewish ended up working in other countries for the benefit of other countries instead of helping out Germany. And, well, we're all better off for it. Uh, anyway, that brings us to the end of the hour, David. So there's plenty more jihad, but we can try to catch up next week. 
It's interesting that uh, we got to so few things this week. There's so much more because this was actually a short week. We were on Thursday last week, and we only had six days in between instead of the usual seven. But the jihadis have been very busy, and Ramadan is coming in just a few weeks. So strap in, folks. It's going to be a rough ride. But pray, hope, and don't worry once again. And God willing, we'll see you again with more jihad. Well, not, not that we want the jihad, but you get the idea next week. I get it.